afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, for joining our session. Um, glad you're all here and glad you can see everything okay and hear everything okay. Um, as Ryan mentioned, uh, as we go along, uh, there's, I think, a manageable number of attendees. So as we go along, if you have a question, type it in and Ryan will, um, will interrupt me and we'll kind of handle the questions as we go. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully make the session a little bit more uh, interactive. If there are quite a few questions, then we may pause and do them towards the end, but we're going to play it by ear and see, see how it goes. But feel free to ask the questions, and if we have an opportunity, I'd rather just uh, answer them as we go along and keep, keep the dialogue going. So, and again, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, forgive my interruption. Mm -hmm. if, no. if, the, if the attendees don't want to type their question and they raise their hand, is it okay to allow yes. them to talk? Yes. Okay, so we've got yeah. a chat option, an allow to talk option, whatever you want to do, guys. Just answer your que ask your question, and we'll um, I'll be paying attention to if you raise your hands too in the in the chat. It's it's uh, for all the attendees. It's your session. It's for your benefit. Uh, for whatever you want to get out of it. So happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Okay. All right, let's get started. Good afternoon. A few years ago, uh, we were evaluating whether to bid on a very prestigious project. It was to supply for a marquee product at a premier brand. The team had focused on top line growth and incremental profits and brought the project forward for approval as both those variables were attractive. The team was very excited about the significant potential revenue enhancement and wanted to move forward. When we reviewed the project as a senior team, along with our board, a number of questions were raised, including how we had performed on similar projects in the past. What was the history with this customer? What were the upside and downside scenarios? Had we considered a different business arrangement? Would we have the capital to invest along with all the other higher priority projects we were pursuing? Many questions that arose as a result of the board's diverse experience and different points of view. Furthermore, we asked the team to assess the cash return on invested capital, which actually turned out to be lower than our cost of capital thereby destroying shareholder value with more downside risk uncovered in our scenario planning given overall economic projections. Based on these evaluations and follow-up discussions, we decided not to pursue what initially appeared to be an attractive project in certain aspects. You're all very smart, driven, creative professionals. I'm sure you have outstanding products, a visceral understanding of your customer and marketplace, highly talented team members, and rich intellectual property. You know your business much better than anyone else. So I'm not here to tell you anything new about any of these things. You know a lot more than I ever will. My only objective today is to trigger some questions and thoughts for you some different perspectives. Are the interests of the shareholders aligned with those of the employees? Have you deployed your limited resources on the projects that drive the highest long-term value? Is your business plan based on robust, stress-tested assumptions? And do you have a contingency plan? Do you understand the key performance drivers of your business? What key metrics are you focused on? And do you know if your business is creating or destroying value? You may have already thought about all of these. If so, maybe this is just a little bit of a refresher for you. If not, it is some food for thought as you move forward growing your amazing business. These are some of the lessons I've learned over the last 25 years, observing what worked in successful enterprises and what did it. My objective today is to share those with you, to spark some thought and dialogue, and then for you to apply them as you see fit in your respective ventures.
First is around governance. In my experiences, whether in public companies or private ones, it was always beneficial to have a well-balanced board of directors. A team of professionals who are not working for the startup day in and day out, who have other jobs and professions that can bring different perspectives, who will look at the business from multiple angles and challenge your and your team's thinking and allow you to be aware of your blind spots. I worked at FLIR Systems, a $5 billion mid-cap technology public company that designs and develops sensor systems that enhance perception and awareness. It was about 50% defense, 50% commercial and consumer business, supplying a variety of imaging systems like thermal, radar, sonar, and visible. On our board, we had venture capitalists, technologists, defense veterans, marketeers, attorneys, financial professionals, researchers, etc., thereby assimilating a rich input on the business. They really challenged our thinking. As soon as we had a couple marketeers added to our board, the dialogue, which historically had been focused on the technology, being a tech company, expanded to include a more robust discussion of the consumer and our brand. We'll talk more about the operating cycle on a later slide. It is also very important to align shareholder and business interests with those of the employees. People focus on what is measured. Are you measuring the key metrics and are you incentivizing your team to improve those? We provided variable compensation to our employees based on a few critical performance indicators. And those could be unique to your business, like market value, shareholder returns, EBITDA growth, profits, cash flow, number of new customers, customer churn, return on invested capital, et cetera. There's many different metrics. You can apply the one that's most appropriate for your business. It is critical to have short term as well as long-term variable compensation to drive the right behaviors and reward employees based on the startup's success. It is also advisable to vest the long-term incentives over time in order to retain key talent. For example, at FLIR, we included inventory terms in short-term compensation metrics as improving working capital was a key priority and we included return on invested capital in long-term compensation metrics. Including these drove focus and improvement in both these metrics over time at FLIR. No matter how large is your business, you will always be capital constrained. Hence, we need to focus on capital allocation. It is one of the most important functions of a CEO that drives long-term value creation. In my experience, having a disciplined capital allocation process, whether it is R&D, capital spending, or human capital, always led to the business and team focusing on the highest priority projects and making the tough choices, as you cannot do everything. The one thing about your business, maybe the only thing in your control, is cost. In my experience, enterprises that have had strong cost control always focused on eliminating waste and non-value-added activities and deploying that capital towards investments that created long-term growth and value. Having rigorous cost control does not mean you need to be cheap. It just means not being wasteful. Asking the question, do we really need to spend this money and if we do, is this the best value we can get from that spend? This has allowed us in the past to survive some very tough times at Ford in South America, where we maintained our self-funded status without any need for capital infusion from our parent in North America, despite a 20% reduction in the automotive industry, a 50 to 100% currency devaluation, and 8 to 20% inflation in local economies. 
It also enabled us to maintain 18 to 20 percent operating margins at FLIR. What is your strategy? Can you succinctly communicate your strategy? It all starts with a winning aspiration. Where do you want to be? What is your vision? What is the end goal? Then the question is, where will we play? What products, customers, geographies, industries, technologies, channels, etc.? It is very crucial to define our sandbox. It enables focus, which is paramount when deploying scarce resources. It also helps define who we are and who we aren't. It is equally important to say no. As Steve Jobs once said, begin quote, people think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things I have done. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things, end quote. This is where your strategy domain and capital allocation comes in. And once you have defined your end and your domain, it is paramount to think through and define how will we win. What is our unique value proposition? What is our competitive advantage? How do we differentiate ourselves? At FLIR Systems, it was all around thermal technology. That's what we focused on, making it available at lower size, weight, power, and cost, with significantly increased the use cases for the technology. Once you've defined your strategy, the question is, have you developed a robust business plan? Of course, a complete business plan includes many aspects, including market analysis, competitive landscape, customer research, product and technology definition, people plan, et cetera. What I'm talking about here are the financial representations of that operating plan. What are your financial projections over the next three to five years, including your income statement, your balance sheet, and your cash flow statement? The level of granularity and specificity will of course reduce as you move further out, but it is important to think through the projections. As you do that, think about the external environment, the overall market and trends, the competitive threats and customer profile, which will help you develop the physicals and assumptions for your business. For example, if it is automotive related, starting with the overall economy, the GDP, consumer sentiment, et cetera, will help determine the overall industry projections. Based on your product, customer, niche, you'll be able to de develop your market penetration or share and your price positioning, which will help determine your top line projections. Based on what you need to engineer and manufacture, you'll need to build up your physicals, equipment and facilities required, level of R&D and engineering, marketing plans, headcount, wages, material needs, etc., which will allow you to build your costs ground up. Having a good understanding of the physicals is critical because at the end of the day, the financial projections are only applying dollar signs to the physicals. As you develop your assumptions, it is also critical to ask why. Why do we think this will happen? Why do we think this is a good assumption? Why will the consumer behave in this manner? And so on. Equally important to think about is the how. How will we develop this project product in this time frame? How will we manufacture the product at this cost structure? How will we market the product using these marketing budgets, etc.? 
This is how it will enable a very robust business plan development. Furthermore, think about scenarios. Point estimates are only good on the day they are developed. They become obsolete on the very next day. So try to build sensitivities. What happens if, for example, we develop scenarios around industry and volume reductions, which enabled us to think through contingency plans, which in our case were quickly applied as COVID-19 struck. So it's very important to think about the different scenarios and contingencies and have a plan in place to respond to those. Once you've developed your business plan and financial projections, I've noticed most companies that do well have a regular cadence, a rhythm. It could be daily or weekly, monthly or quarterly at different levels of specificity. By having a rhythm, it allows the team to stay on top of the business with real-time monitoring. Once you've set your targets and developed your business plan, the team is off implementing it, driving and delivering the operating targets, whether it is development of the product, feature enhancements, attracting new customers, retaining old ones, etc. And you're continually monitoring the external environment, which is changing, resulting in a new forecast of your business different from your targets. This allows the team to focus on the expected outcomes and developing recovery plans to adjust the business to the changing environment. This was the famous business plan review process that Alan Mulally instituted at Ford as he saved the company from the brink of bankruptcy. Before I jump in into financial analysis, uh, I'll take a pause here. I know I've spoken a lot on, on these slides. And uh, so I'll kind of turn it over if there's any questions, Ryan, or anyone yeah. from the team, maybe we can, we can address some of those uh, before I jump into specifics of uh, financial analysis. Yes, we have two questions. Um, the first from Stephanie Rogers. Should we create financial proje projections based on different situations or stages of growth? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Um, yes, you will need to think about uh, the projections based on where you're at. You're absolutely right, because obviously, initially, there's probably going to be a fair amount of investment that's going to go in pre-revenue and a lot of assumptions around what it takes that needs to be done before you can even have your first sale. And once that is done, going through that phase is very different than once you are in the launch phase, which is again, heavy investment with a fair amount of marketing uh, leading up to sort of a, an adoption curve, if you will, right? If you think about technology, uh, the adoption curve is the very uh, classic curve where you need a certain level of adoption before it kind of takes off. So yes, you will have to think about the different state that your business is in, the different external environment trends that exist, as well as competitive and customer choices. And all of those will need to go into developing your projections based on the scenario that you're in. And again, as I said, it's very important to think about multiple scenarios because point estimates we all know are never going to pan out the way they are, they are written down. So it's always good to think about variances and some level of variability and how will you operate within that band. All right. Um, Stephanie, how was that? Let me know in the chat. Um, a question from Jerome. When developing a new product, should projection be based on competitors' historical financial statements? So I, I would say that, you know, you definitely, definitely need to think about um, the competitor's financial state, historical statements. You need to think about whatever intelligence you have about the marketplace, not just the overall environment, but about your competition, as well as take in whatever you know about the customer. But it's very important to start from some level of 
uh, grounded data, which is based in reality. And so using the competitor's historical statements is a good place to start. What I will warn you, however, is always, you know, that could be a very good starting point, but you really need to think about how are you different from your competitors? What are the different factors and factor those in, in your projections? And how are times different, right? When you're looking at historical, it will give you a good foundation, but you also need to think about what might be changing as we go forward. So yes, start with that, start with any data that you have, but going forward, you need to overlay that with your own reality, how you're different from anyone else, how the custom, your customers might be different, what they may or may not be willing to buy and or pay for, as well as the trends in the marketplace. Okay. And, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, keep, yeah, I hope, uh, yeah, as, as Ryan said, if you um, uh, let us know if, if that responds, if not, then I can elaborate on that. But uh, next one. Yeah, let us know in the chat, Jerome. Stephanie is pleased with her feedback, by the way, Amit. And a question from Eric. How do you best develop estimates, predictions, assumptions, during the early stage or even pre-revenue timeframe? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, again, it's not easy and there is no, um, you know, if you will, cookbook uh, is what I would say. And, and sometimes these things you have to, you know, for a certain period of time, it may be very difficult and you may have to go on uh, intuition and a little bit of gut feel uh, at the initial stages. But as I said, uh, the key is really to use any and all available data, whether it is his competitors, historical, uh, similar other businesses, any customer research you may have, any other industry that might be similar. So uh, you have to look at you know, a variety of different uh, input drivers, but then uh, at the end of the day, there might be unique circumstances where it might still make it very hard in the near term, but again, when I say near term, it, it probably is you know a few months um, to maybe max a year kind of time frame, but less than that. Uh, beyond that, you have to start with uh, with some assumption based on the data that you have. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it may not be uh, quite possible. The other thing you could do is also look at the closest surrogate and then do some stress tests, right? So you start with something that may or may not be correct, but then you do some variances on that to put forth a certain range. And yes, um, um, that's something that, you know, you can then talk about uh, things could be, and, and people obviously sometimes get leery about ranges because you have a downside and an upside, but that's something that we all need to be comfortable thinking through because as I said, you know, very rarely do point estimates come out to be true. And it's always good to think about the range of possible outcomes. And um, to follow up, Eric yeah. is saying that his concern is how potential investors will look at gut feel numbers. Yes, um, yes. Uh, right. absolutely right, because investors want returns and they want uh, some hard data and facts. And uh, at, the, at the end of the day, they want uh, returns on their equity. And, and you're absolutely right. It, it is hard. And that's why it's important to do your homework, do your research, uh, scope out, you know, what do you know uh, about the competitors, the history, any publicly available data, any research, customer research you can do. Sometimes you can commission your own research to gather data that, that may not exist very easily and any other surrogates. So that's what you start with. But at the end of the day, you have to overlay some level of judgment because what you have collected is only a starting point. And at some point you will have to overlay some level of judgment into that. And for your investors, for yourself, when you can do a range of outcomes, it gives you a little bit better perspective of where the business could go and how you would be prepared to respond to that. Okay. All right. He says, fantastic. And then we've got one more. Do you have time for that? Yes, 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 yes. From Siobhan, do you have any suggestions or resources we can use for analytics around hashtag growth or any other social media metrics to demonstrate an increasing desire by the public? And she gives an example. Um, 
more people seeking black owned businesses as a result of the BLM movement? Um, uh, am I, I'm not seeing that that was a long question. Am I, I'm not seeing that on the chat. Am I able to see that question? Brian, it, by any chance? Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. I, well, it's, it's in the Q and a, do you see that? Let me, uh, look it up. Okay. Here it is. All right. And I, it, it should be in the answered part. Okay, here it is. Do you have any suggestions or resources we can use for analytics around hashtag growth or any other social media metrics to demonstrate an increasing desire by the public? For example, more people seeking black on as a result of the BLM movement. So in terms of the, uh, around the growth and the social media metrics, obviously some of the ones that you can get very easily from uh, Google analytics or Facebook, et cetera, is you know, the number of, you know, hits to something, the, um, uh, what is the other thing called? I forget the name. Um, the, uh, trying a uh, mental bla uh, block right now. Um, shoot. Um, but there are metrics in terms of overall hits to a site or a number of searches or number of, um, uh, looks to, you know, your type of product and or other social media outlets, the, um, I'm drawing a blank, but there's a very important uh, indicator for online um, businesses. I, it'll come to me. So let's pause on this one. Uh, but, but those would be some that I would, I would suggest. I, I don't know of many others besides, you know, you, what you could do is also do some commissioned research by some of these smaller uh, outfits like more pace, et cetera, et cetera, that can do research for you on uh, some of these, uh, some of these metrics. Okay. All right. I don't see any more okay. questions. Siobhan, let us know in the chat if that, answered your question um and i know it's not very i know it's not very robust um but uh, i i just can't remember the uh can't remember it right now it, it'll probably come to me okay okay um okay so let's talk about financial analysis one key aspect that I've noticed some companies are lacking in is a good understanding of what happened. Oh, came to me, net promoter score. Uh, that's something, again, you can look at um, in terms of the applicability and favorability of your website or your uh, product hits and so on and so forth, okay? So again, going back to financial analysis. So one of the things that I've seen companies lacking in is good understanding of what happened and why. That is an analysis of the variances. As I said, invariably, your revised forecast of the business will be different than the established targets. So it's critical to understand why. Data and analysis leads to insights which drive action and results. To highlight this point, here is a simplified example from FLIR Systems, which shows that the overall margin improved by two points year over year from quarter one 2016 to quarter one 2017. When you peel back the onion, segment A was flat, while segment B improved by 300 basis points. Note. In this case, I've simplified the analysis from six segments at FLIR when I was there to about two for this example. Question is, what happened and why? Which will allow us to develop specific action plans to continue doing what we're doing well and improve what wasn't working well. So as you peel back the onion and perform the financial analysis on the variance, you can see that segment A had experienced a negative mix, which is more lower margin products were sold than higher margin products, while the manufacturing plants performed better than the established standards, i.e. what we expected them to do, 
So they were better in doing what uh, we had expected them to do. For segment B, we had added new products that improved margin, which also enabled us to price the rest of the portfolio due to the momentum in the marketplace, the halo effect. However, our manufacturing facilities had some challenges building the new products at the expected cost levels. This allowed us to better understand what was going on in the business so that we could keep doing what was working and focus on correcting what wasn't. These variance drivers obviously might be different based on the type of business. The point here was to give you an example of how we looked at it at FLIR Systems for the type of business that we were to be able to pinpoint what are the performance drivers in the business, what is going on and why, with a view to then work on corrective action plans. Some key financial metrics to focus on, cash flow. I'm sure you've heard cash is king because at the end of the day, that is what matters. Cash pays the bills, not profits. And companies go bankrupt because they run out of cash. So at all the companies that I've worked at, I've always driven a focus on cash flow. Second is around debt covenants. If you have debt, you will have debt covenants. Most common ones that I've seen are leverage ratio, which is the ratio of your debt to your EBITDA, and fixed charge coverage, which shows how well your EBITDA covers the required interest and principal payments. It is critical that you stay on top of these so as not to default and keep on monitoring where the business is at. Another metric I've focused on is the return on invested capital. In case of some projects, the internal rate of return. This measures the return you're getting on your investment. For example, if you invest $100 and make $10, your return is 10%. It is critical that you ret your return on invested capital is higher than the cost of the capital you're deploying in the business. If not, you will be destroying value. For example, if you borrow $100 at 5% interest and invest it in your business to earn $3 or 3%, you're destroying value as you're paying more to borrow the $100 than you're making on it. That is a sure way to go out of business. This is the most important metric, I believe, the cash on cash return on invested capital. We use this metric to reject projects, some very prestigious programs, as they did not result in sufficient returns for the company. One piece that we sometimes overlook as we focus on top line growth, gross and operating margins and returns on sales is working capital. The amount of capital you need day in and day out to run your operations. Capital that is locked in your business which is your accounts receivables and inventory, less accounts payables. As you focus on cash, you need to pay special attention to working capital. At FLIR, we drove initiatives to drive faster collections of our receivables, extend payment terms where we saw competitive opportunities, and reduced our inventory to optimum levels to free up cash by over 10%. Again, very important to focus on the working capital. So, in closing, I hope I've triggered these 10 questions slash thoughts for you to consider. First, well-constituted boards can provide invaluable, diverse perspectives. Does your compensation plan align 
shareholder and business interests with those of your employees? And does it enable retention? Focus on disciplined capital allocation to deploy constrained resources is a key driver of long-term value creation. What is the only aspect of your business that you truly control? What is your strategy stated in one sentence? What's the objective? What's the scope? And what's the advantage? Do you have a robust business plan? Considering the external environment, key assumptions, and sensitivities. A disciplined operating rhythm enables close monitoring of the business and quick action. Do you understand performance of your business? What happened and why tied to the physicals? Cash is king. Pay attention to debt covenants and working capital management. And is your business generating return on invested capital greater than your cost of capital? If not, you're destroying value. Thank you. Okay, that was my prepared presentation and I will take any other questions you may have. Do we have any other questions out there, everyone? And if someone wants to, you know, raise their hand and, and talk, that's fine too, if you don't want to type something up. I think there is a question. I don't, Ryan, I think you'll probably have to let them unmute them or something. I don't know how that works. Yeah, let's see who is raising. I don't see the hand raised. Let's see. Oh, J Jerome. All right, Jerome, I'm going to allow you to talk. Here we go. Jerome, you are on mute. All right. Hey there. Hello. I wanted to, I wanted to ask a question. Is it for a small business startup, we don't have, do we have to use sophisticated techniques like uh, future value of cash and present value, or we just keep it simple model? Um, you, you'll keep a simple model in terms of, you know, uh, income statement and cash flow. And, you know, obviously you'll have to kind of lay out your income statement, cash flow and balance sheet, because you'll have to know how much funding and financing you need and what the cash generated is. So that's what you, and once you've developed the, the cash flow model, and again, uh, doesn't have to be too complicated depending on the physicals of the business. You don't have to go overboard, but once you've done that and you have your cash, then you can calculate what the returns are on your investment and what's your overall return on invested capital. So I would say that that's important and the, you know, the internal rate of return of your project, that's very important. Um, but you don't need to do, you know, 25 different metrics. Does it answer your question, Jerome? Yeah, yes, it does. Okay. All right. We've got three questions for you, Amit. Um, we'll go with Carl first. All right. How do you determine the appropriate EBIT target for your business? And he gives an example um, for a business that sells a software product, but also has a services revenue stream. Yeah, so uh, the, the way I, I would suggest is to start, uh, again, this will have to be a multi-pronged approach. Uh, some of the, uh, I can't give you a specific for your business, but what I would suggest is um, to look at some other competitive data that you may find, which is uh, other companies that might be in a very similar business, and that might be in um, similar industries and similar, uh, similar, similar products. So that would be a good place to start with. Uh, and, and then the other thing to look at is what will it take you 
to uh, develop this pro pro product uh, because at the end of the day, it is also your um, uh, physicals, right? That will help determine what it will take for you to develop those. And the third key piece is uh, where are you going to, how are you going to price this product? And again, that's based on whatever competitive marketplace data you have and or surrogate data you have uh, and or in this case, you can actually commission some customer research, some very low cost customer research online uh, based on surveys and focus groups to get some sense of what people might be willing to pay for what you have to offer. Now, once you've done all of that, that will help you determine what's an appropriate level of EBIT for you. But at the end of the day, the question really is whatever that EBIT is, which again, you come, come at it through all these different um, perspectives is really given your investment, will that EBIT and will that cash flow give you a good return on the invested capital, right? So if you have to go out and borrow money at a certain rate and you can invest your money in the equity market at a certain rate, right? You know your cost of equity, let's say it's eight to 10%, 15%, depending on the risk premium. And you have, let's say five to 7% of cost of debt. When you mix those two and see what's the cost of capital for your business, if your margin profile, if your EBIT is not able to deliver that, then you're destroying value, right? So that's the piece you've got to think about and say, is it really worth it to get into the business unless it is a temporary thing as you're launching and then you can see a way to price the product and or produce it where the combination of those two gives you a return that is above your cost of capital. Um, okay. Does that answer your question? Um, I'll, I'll go to the next one and then if it doesn't, please comment back. But uh, what's the next one? From Sandra, many businesses lose money at first. How long to wait to access problems with ne negative returns? And she's thinking about all the unicorns and VC rounds for years. And so some of this is, again, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to do. It's very easy to say. Uh, it's very hard to do because um, as you do this, um, as you said, initially there will be a, letter, a level of cash burn and, you know, your assumptions may not be correct, right? And you may be six months into it and then you find that uh, things have changed and you've got to kind of regroup and, read this, look at your business model and re look at your assumptions. So it will likely take some level of time and effort. The key really is, do you see uh, at some point with some assumptions, a way to get around this and get to a place where you're able to generate some returns. And sometimes, as I said, it's not easy. No one wants to hear this, but sometimes it will be on gut feel. Sometimes it will be based on trends you're seeing in the marketplace where you can't really quantify completely. But at the end of the day, and, you know, and you'll probably have to give yourself a certain level of runway uh, before pulling the plug. But at some point, you'll need to decide if after doing everything, and after looking at all possible outcomes, if it's something that you just don't see um, in a reasonable manner uh, generating cash, then you've got to ask, your, ask the question, is this really worth pursuing? Uh, and if the answer is yes, it's not only for sort of strategic reasons, it's how is that going to generate cash flow and, and returns for you and the investors? All right. Let us know um, how that answer was in the chat. Yes, she says, thank you. Sandra says, thank you. So I mean, just a heads up, we've got a question from Grace, um, Patricia, Farouk wants to talk, and then we have a question from Stephanie. So, Grace's question, if our business plan does not meet your criteria, does it mean we should not start the business? That, that's, that's an excellent question, and what I would say is you gotta think very hard, right? There's all the things about the initial investment, it's gonna take some level of time, there's an adoption curve, uh, on and on and on, right? So you can look at all of that. You can look at all available existing data. You can even overlay some level of judgment and gut feel because many times, uh, you know, with, with massive revolutionary inventions, 
you know, there was no customer data. There was no existing customer. People even, even didn't know that they wanted something. So some of those things will take some level of work and uh, before they pick up traction. But so, so you'll have to decide what that period is until when you keep trying um, with those principles. But beyond that, you have to seriously ask the question, if you've gone through that and if you've gone through that runway and if it, you still can't see uh, an end, a light uh, at the end of the tunnel, the question is really, should you be continuing with the business or not? And, and I would say, if you just cannot see a way around it, no matter what the scenarios, uh, after you've given it a try for some period of time, then you probably may need to think about, ignore the sunk costs and either change the idea, adjust it, tweak it, or kind of throw it out and kind of start afresh. Okay. Okay. Um, let us know, Grace. And okay, Patricia, she says she had to join late. Apologies. What are some online customer research resources? So uh, I have personally not looked at all of them, but uh, you know, I believe that there is, um, you can look at uh, Google, uh, provides Google Analytics service. I think Facebook does the same. Uh, there used to be a firm in the, uh, I forget the name now, uh, IHS might be doing some of that work for you more pace was a firm that did market research for you, customer research, uh, online surveys, and so on and so forth. Okay, Farouk. Gonna allow Farouk to talk. Yes, um, hi Amin, thank you very hi. much. It's been very, very useful for me. So my question was that obviously when we start the business, there are so many assumptions. So how often should we go back and adjust our revenue model or financial model? Um, the, uh, again, you know, just like many other things, you know, I'm going to give you an answer that's not going to be precise. It, it, it sort of depends a little bit on, uh, on your business and how quickly the assumptions change or don't change. Obviously, you don't want to get into an analysis paralysis mode where you're looking at this thing every single day and trying to update and kind of going crazy. Uh, so at the same I'm time, you don't. But I go back every day almost. <laughs> but at the same time, what you don't want to do is wait for a year, right? So because you know, if you if you focus too much on recranking uh, the data and the assumptions, etc., you you know you won't focus as much on really making the idea and the product and the company work. Uh, so I would do it probably, you know, maybe relook at it once a month to to start with. Um, maybe, you know, at that frequency, because trying to do it a lot more um, frequently, A, is going to take up a lot of time, it's going to drive you crazy, and things will keep changing every day, and you might run into sort of an analysis paralysis mode. Because at the end, you've got to set a stake in the ground, but then give it a try, because what will also happen is things will change, and many times things change because of external factors, whether it's customer, competitor, the environment, many times it changes because of what you do, right? And that's the whole beauty of the forecast versus the target to understand once you've made a forecast and it's off of your target, you say, okay, well, what assumptions am I going to change? The ones that I control to make it get closer to where I want to be. So how am I going to be able to get more customers? How am I going to be able to price the product uh, for a better return? How am I going to improve my cost? How am I going to get more efficient at developing these, these uh, features or, or what have you? So a lot of it depends on, you know, how you're going to be able to change the, the physicals of the business. And so it's very important to do it, but then focus on the physicals and then reforecast rather than just try to get on this sort of um, spinning wheel and kind of just keep churning. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. For, okay. And one more. Stephanie Rogers says she has a military and global supply chain background with a do more with less attitude. Mm -hmm. And she now, she's now a data science technical founder with a blind spot on spending money. 
Do you think it would be worth it to bring on someone that feels comfortable spending so that we don't shortchange ourselves seeking funding? No, that, that's a very good question. And, you know, uh, my background also uh, from the auto industry to some extent, then going into FLIR, which was high tech. So I was at GM and Ford, then I went to FLIR. And that was a big adjustment also because, you know, I was, I was bringing a lot of good with the intense focus on cost and uh, eliminating waste, so on and so forth. But then going into a high-tech environment, I had to adapt and learn that, yes, we need to do that. But at the same time, you have to be willing to spend money where it makes sense, right? And so that's the, the judgment question. And that's where, yes, you may need some counterpoints of view, but make sure that the people you pick uh, are ones that you trust and respect their judgment because spending money for the sake of spending money is not the right answer, right? The right answer is, when I say spending money, it's really an investment in the business. Yes, so you have to invest to get customers. Yes, you have to invest to develop your products. Yes, you have to invest to build something, right? So in those areas where, and it's the old saying, penny wise and pound foolish, right? You don't want to keep saving pennies and not make the right investments to really generate significant returns. So it's, it's a balance. And yes, having some counterpoints of view, people who you respect their judgment and who understand Again, you don't want to waste money, but you do want to invest. Okay. All right. So it looks like we've got about five more minutes. So maybe we have, oh, we've got some in the Q&A. Oh, a thank you there. And Catherine says, I'm a paint artist and that's my passion and just started working on her virtual and mobile business teaching art and selling her own. Cool. Um, her question is, who can she reach out to for marketing that has knowledge in that area? Uh, I'm at a loss here, Catherine. I, I don't know uh, if someone else from uh, the attendees knows, feel free to um, respond in the chat. But, but I, I don't know who's knowledgeable in this area. Um, um, Catherine, it looks like DMA. Jerome says DMA. Jerome. Looks like we've got some help in the chat with that question. Fiverr. Okay. So, Catherine, if you can Good. refer to the chat, it looks like people are um, answering that question there. All right, okay. she sees it, she sees it. So um, yeah, I, or do we have any last minute questions? All right, it looks like we're good to go. Amit, this was wonderful. I feel like everyone said their questions were answered greatly. Um, let me start my video here. I wanna thank you all for coming in. I mean, thank you so much. This was wonderful and insightful. Um, so I hope you all continue to have a good rest of your Detroit startup week because thank we're going all the way until Friday. Yeah, thank you. And thank you uh, again, Ryan, for helping out. And thanks to all the participants for all the great, A, for attending, and then all the great, all the great questions. It's um, it's been good. And that's what I was looking for is this more of a dialogue because at the end, the purpose of the session was really for you uh, to get whatever you wanted to get out of it uh, that, that I could share. So again, thank you very much for the questions. I, I hope you didn't think this was a waste of your time. Uh, and I really enjoyed, I enjoyed the discussion and the questions. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks, Ryan.